We can make cells younger now, that's pretty neat. Hi, I'm King Dangerously, this is a time vortex from the 2120s. We're remembering the next 100 years. Babraham is the name of the cool institute in Cambridge, the Babraham Institute, that did some research in the early 2020s, released in April of 2022. You can go look it up, about reversing the age of skin cells by 30 years, which is pretty good. That's not nothing. 30 years off a wrinkle or a freckle or the hair growing out the back of your thumb that you don't know what it's doing. Where are you, hair? Why are you a different colour than all the rest of my hairs? I don't know, it's, it's gone missing actually. What's it doing now? Hopefully fun things. You can, by immersing cells in what we call Yamanaka factors, after the scientist Yamanaka, who in the 2007 zone reversed the condition of a skin cellule back to its stem cell state which at the time, and still even looking back from the 2100s, was a pretty big deal. Being able to take a fully formed cell and wind back the clock to its pluripotent state of being able to become any kind of part of the body, any different type of cell, was a huge accomplishment. And so the researchers at Babraham, <laughs> I just keep smiling, it sounds so pretty, <laughs> um, rewound the skin cells uh, in their experiment about 30 years by taking those same Yamanaka factors, the molecules used to revert a cell back to a stem cell state, but applying them for less time. So in the original experiment, Yamanaka immersed the cells for 50 straight days to get them back to a stem cell state. The Babraham Institute scientists only did it for 13 days, so what they did was wind back the clock of the cell a little bit, and what they were hoping to do, which they think they largely did do, was rewind the cell's age without completely deleting its identity. So it could still be a skin cell and do things like produce collagen, which it did at higher rates than the control cells that didn't receive the rejuvenation molecules. Um, so they measured its age reversal by two properties they call the epigenetic clock and the transcriptome. Loosely, the epigenetic clock is like the chemicals that accompany the genetic information in these cells, and the transcriptome is a full list of that genetic information. And just gauging by those metrics and using their previous work as a benchmark, they were able to estimate that they had rewound the clock on these skin cells approximately 30 years. So that's obviously a pretty exciting jumping off point for age reversal therapies and rejuvenation coming up down the road. In the 2120s, when I'm from, it's very common and widespread to stop and reverse age processes in the body. In the 2020s, it's sort of a borderline revolutionary still thing to do. Um, in fact, to the point that it almost bothers some people, there are arguments that crop up about like having too many humans on the planet and like using too many resources. and. And there's a sort of genuine, genuine, honestly, uh, insinuation of, uh, of like an unseemly greediness, wanting to be around for longer. Uh, and the one thing that you can say to people to help them calm down about that is that no one's asking to live for the entire length of the universe, uh, although it might be cool to do that if it were possible, um, or most of it, much of it anyway. But 50 more years here or there, maybe a hundred more years, maybe even a thousand more years. What's so wrong about that? There's a lot of space out there. Uh, and if you've got another day in you or another career in you or another planet in you, more power to you, you know, have fun. If you can enjoy life, you should try. So says we. What does this mean for the immediate future and the midterm future and the futury future? In the futury future, it means age is basically over. We can like largely reverse the aging process. Um, and we'll talk about the one exception in just a moment. In the midterm, it means people are going to be living a lot longer and they're going to be living healthy, active lives a lot longer. Uh, and even middle-aged folks are going to start sort of reverting as a standard practice back to the, where their bodies were in the 20s or 30s. Luckily, they will have learned a few things, so they're not quite as silly as they were when they were 22. They got some of their worldly expertise and hopefully empathy, kindness, 
a little depth that they might have felt like they were lacking in their earlier days. Um, but they'll get back some of the physical energy that they had and the vim and vigor of, uh, of youth, which, you know, is the dream combination. As they say, youth is wasted on the young. And they say that because young people don't know how good they have it. It's really fun to be young, but also you're sort of missing the context. And that's an inevitable experience of living in a timeline of any kind. Like this one. Time, 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 time. What does it mean for the immediate future? More research. <laughs> so in the 2020s, this stuff is largely still on paper. There will be some more breakthroughs like this about Yamanaka factors and uh, how you can back up the clock of a cell to make it act like a younger cell, but it's wobbly, it's early days still. Um, in the middle of the century, by the 30s and the 40s, this is starting to become like a much more widespread phenomenon. And you might expect that its first real forays are largely cosmetic, like, yeah, skin cells, just like this experiment was working with, reversing the age damage to our beautiful visages that has been wreaked on us by the savage claws of time and restoring us to our youthful glow and vigor. Um, in the later half of the century, that starts to become a fully body immersive experience. Like you can do it with all the parts of your body, including, and this is the critical sticking point, your brain. And so that's the one place that we've got to sort of zoom in just a little bit and we'll leave on this note. You can scrub a brain cell and turn it back, but you can't keep all the information while you're doing that. And uh, a lot of what the brain retains about its experience of the world, it retains in connections between its cells. So if you go scrubbing all those cells, it's very difficult to do that without erasing those connections. So early versions of brain rejuvenation therapy erase a lot of that stuff. And so there are in early days, some fairly sickening trade-offs at times to make between brain health and continued living and continued instinctive connection with your identity and your historical memory, you know, who your loved ones are, things you have done with them. It might be as simple as a small detail you don't remember about a birthday party for a co-worker, or it might be as profound as your daughter's face. Uh, I'm afraid that in the earlier parts of this rejuvenation tech, even in the 30s and the 40s, that stuff rears its head and, and is um, a major part of the challenge. And then even in the 50s and the 60s, uh, as the workarounds start to come online, there's still a sort of transitionary phase during which many people who have brain rejuvenation choose to undergo a sort of thorough memory mapping process before the rejuvenation so that they are able to, to the greatest extent possible, retain or at least return to the memories that they want to keep the most. So they might go through a process with a team of professionals of identifying some of the areas of their life that they want most desperately to cling to and to have a, a real vivid sense of. In the later half of the century, when we've got like really good brain analytic technology um, and insanely detailed visual mapping of the synapse connections that make the brains what they are, um, you can retain that information in a scan. So rather than doing like a team process of working through your memories or like journaling, so you can read and be like, oh yeah, that my wedding night was in Cancun. That's right, I, I recall now, or maybe I don't recall, but I know because I've got this exterior information Later in the process, they'll be able to pull out that information, rejuvenate the cells, and then plug the information back in so that all of the experience remains visceral. You can still access in your own brain the images of that wedding night in Cancun and how you and your loved one dragged your fingers through the sea and watched the luminescence mirror the stars in the sky. There's something beautiful here about choosing your past or your present and your future. And if you've got a pick, I encourage you to look forward 
Um, as, as beautiful and wonderful and important as the past is, uh, it's even more critical in some ways that today is all right and that tomorrow can be filled with hope and light, even if you start to let go of the parts of the past you'd always thought of as defining you. In some senses, this is the process of growing in any temporal arrow experience. Ideally, of course, we get to have it all, the future and the history, wrapped up in one glorious sum. I hope you have a glorious some kind of day or evening or whatever's in between day or evening. Future history out. See you in the younger. What? <laughs> <laughs>